Who's excited to be alive this morning? All the people coming in, excited to be alive? I'm going to change that. I'm kidding. No, I'm going to talk about science and technology and food today first. Uh, Welcome to everyone. Welcome to uh, the Royal Highnesses. Uh, welcome to all of the eaters. Uh, and welcome to the people whose minds I intend to blow by giving a talk that I wrote over breakfast. I just want to be real. One of our speakers didn't make it for a family emergency, and I had the privilege of taking his time. And if you've seen me speak before, I will take two minutes for every minute that I've received. Let me start with what's going on in science, food, and technology. I think we're in the middle of a revolution, and everyone says the word revolution, and I want to just take us back in history to say a little bit about what that means and what we should expect, and how incredibly different everything could be. First agricultural revolution, that is the dawn of civilization. We owe everything to what we are today, to the fact that we could plant things in the same place, eat them, and create a society and create culture. Second revolution, all about the advent of technology-based societies. When we talk about technology today, it is literally inherent in everything we've ever done since we created the plow, since we created mechanical harvesting, since we created everything that allowed a city to grow, to be so far away from all the places that we planted. Third one, uh, we would talk about this more as the vertical integration. This includes biotechnology. So when we talk about all the things with DNA sequencing that are going on and, and all the advancements in the biological sciences, that is still very squarely in the third agricultural revolution. So the question is, what's the fourth and what will it look like? I know last time I broke a lot of hearts when I asked you what the age of an apple was, the average age of an apple. Does anyone remember that? Does anyone remember what the average age of the apple is in a grocery store in the United States? A year. a year, so close, 14 months. So I thought I'd just also bring something to the forefront today to, you know, truffle oil. Who eats truffle oil? Do you know that a lot of truffle oil is cut with motor oil? Look that up. All right, so that's all to preface that we are squarely in the age of the Anthropocene. When people talk about natural, you have to question it right off the bat because nothing is natural. Farming is not natural, never has been. Farming is the process, literally the most unnatural process in the world. So when we talk about what the future is gonna hold and we say, oh, it has to be natural, it has to be all these things, we need to stop and remember that right now is a time that 95% of the scientists that have ever lived are alive and working today that everything is changing, that, that the influence of man is so total that it has its own geological reference in time. So as we move forward, I think we need to look at what this landscape really holds for us. It holds a ton of promise and it holds a ton of moral hazard that we need to be aware of, talk about, but know that it's happening. So one of the things that's on the, the list to talk about in this kind of circus of the future is obviously CRISPR. How many people have heard of CRISPR? Eh, half the room. How many people actually know what it is? Tenth of the room. Okay. Uh, CRISPR simply is the thing that you've heard about that's already old. Uh, this is editing genes, the ability to cheaply and effectively edit something into a gene to make corn more corn-like or more corn-like the way that we want it, which we've been doing, by the way, since 10,000 BC, the first GMO, if you didn't know. Uh, so CRISPR's on the scene. This gives us an articulated approach to gene editing that we've never had before. But guess what's already on the scene behind it? Gene drive. Gene drive means we can take an edit and we can make it, we can force it to be inheritable in an organism. Now that sounds pretty scary if you think about it because that's ecosystem engineering, that's doing things at a complexity that, that, that we simply as scientists don't understand, but it also means things like ridding the world of malaria, ridding the world of Lyme disease. There's actually a, a, a colleague of mine that's invented something called daisy chain. That means taking a CRISPR edit that's used with gene drive to make it inheritable, but spreading that edit across chromosomes. Now, I know I'm talking a lot of science for early in the morning, but if you think about it, it just means that when animals start breeding that have been edited, that edit will get weaker and weaker because it's spread across a number of chromosomes. What this means is they could calculate how long it would take that edit to exit an ecosystem. And in fact, now they're already trying this on an island. Uh, well, they're, they're working with community very openly to try this on an island outside Kentucket for Nantucket for Lyme disease. So we have the tools to designing life now. What we do with those tools is huge and open questions, but we cannot bury our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. 
designer cells and microbes. The speaker that was supposed to speak today was going to talk to you about soil microbiomes, a company called Indigo Ag. So what he would say is on this left-hand side why I put them in is that with literally the, the complete white space, no one understands all the soil microbiome, all the different trillions of, of microbes and bacteria and viruses and how they affect plants. Out of this sea of information, they've selected literally two microbes now, just two, enrobe them in a seed coating, plant those seeds in the ground, and, and, and in turn plant a new microbiome that starts to regenerate inside of a soil that creates, I think it's cotton, and he probably would have told you something like they have a yield in, a increase efficiency of 20% just with a few microbes. That's a yield increase that agriculture hasn't seen in the last 50 years. We're, we're incremental. We're, we're point by point, not 20%, not 10%, not these huge jumps. So look for that to be incredibly special. You'll hear from Aaron from New Harvest. I happen to get to sit on the board of this amazing nonprofit that's doing all the cellular uh, agricultural research about pork cells and chicken cells and beef cells and, and what do you feed these cells to create an animal product that is a no-kill product, that is a more sustainable product, but they're doing it open source and they're sharing their information. This is not a proprietary company because they know the future lies in open information around biology. So I'm excited to hear Aaron speak. And of course, you have leathers also being made this way. This is a consumer product that's actually already being sold, if you haven't followed that. I think it's like a really expensive watch band because you can, it's really expensive to grow a lot of leather cells outside of a cow. Um, so this is going on. There's a startup called Farmers Business Network I want to highlight in the United States. This is, a, I think, going on in a lot of different places, but one that I've seen very, very interesting and effective. They have more in-field data than the USDA, our government, has digitized in their company in the last five years versus the USDA's 20 years. 20, well, however long, the, I mean, since they've been digital, which might be just a couple years. Um, but... This is, this is huge data vacuums being built right now to take data out of our physical world, bring it into a virtual world, model, model it, and take it forward. The way that they make money is actually not on the data, because a lot of people are scared. Like, if I give up my data, what are you going to know about me? How are you going to use it? They, the first thing they did was find out that the price of commodity inputs, seed and fertilizers that everybody uses that come from all of the same sources, were 20 to 80 percent priced differently, co-op to co-op, county to county. And so they eliminated that right away. They built a marketplace for the farmers that contribute data that allow them to buy inputs at transparent pricing, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Really excited to see what's going to happen uh, in ventures like this. It's a company called SIBO. SIBO interestingly combines funding from Flagship Pioneering, which is the largest life science biotech VC in Cambridge, with Al Gore, with Peter Thiel. Like, these three things, these three entities, people's ideologies coming together to fund a company, you have to wonder what that company is doing. What SIBO is doing is a science-based computational agronomy approach. What does that mean? It means that they are building simulators for the ecosystems of the natural world. Now, they're only a few years old, and they're making progress, I mean, amazingly quickly, honestly, from what I've seen, but know that this is coming, that we will simulate the natural world limitlessly, that we will then run the scenario of how do we use less water, how do we use less nitrogen, how do we get more nutrition, how do we do all the things that everyone in this room cares about, but how do we do it with a science-based approach? Design Herself. This is a project called Foodome from the Laszlo, uh, Laszlo Barabasi's lab, who I'm now collaborating with alongside George Church, and very, who's one of the kind of seminal genome characters running around Harvard. This is Laszlo's work, but I'll, show, I'll tell you what we're going to think about doing with it, which is he's trying to break down all of the things that people have eaten into their chemical constituents. There's a study at Harvard called the Nurses Study, which has tracked nurses for the last 30 years. What they ate versus what their conditions became. You know, heart disease and diabetes and all that. Well, the, th the, the study just said broccoli. But you can't just say broccoli. You have to say the 20,000 chemical constituents that make up a broccoli. So that you can try to search through all of that chemical compound information mapped against our individual genome information to say how it would affect our disease, the disease that has not yet expressed. Do, am I predisposed to Alzheimer's? 
Could I feed myself more nuts to make my brain stay more attached to this, uh, the walls of my skull so that I don't develop Alzheimer's? This is becoming possible very, very quickly. Oh, I didn't even tell you. We were trying to do diabetes basil. That was the idea. Ask me about it later. Um, I'm sure you've seen retail disruption, and of course, I'm two minutes for everyone. Uh, retail disruption, Amazon buying Whole Foods the next day, Walmart kicking all of their uh, vendors off of Amazon's cloud, uh, which is a, an interesting thing to know that the, now the cloud is political in food. Um, and of course, the, the day that Amazon announces a meal delivery service, Blue Apron stock price gets cut in half. So these are incredible things that are happening uh, that I think are really going to change. And the last one I'll just quickly mention, because I'm sure it won't be the most comfortable thing. I'm, I'm not saying the most comfortable things, I'm sure. The fight for the meaning of organic or the fight for the meaning of local. And what's the next thing going to be called? Because we know in this room, I am sure, that a lot about organic and a lot about local is marketing. And what they're selling you is a promise and a dream, but not necessarily fact. Is it better for you? Unknown. Is it more sustainable, really? Unknown. Because we're not tracking that. We're just tracking the promises and the ideas and all that. And by the way, you have to pay a lot more for it most of the time. So there's an interesting, huge debate of this kind of you know, world shifting. So hopefully what I've done is completely confuse you. That's my technique, is to just freak you out. Um, no, there are so many problems in the world of food that I think it's disempowering to talk about them all the time. It's disempowering to just hear 60% of the 50% of the 40% are gonna starve and die and nobody knows why, or like we should fix it and then everyone walks off stage. So I'll show you a little bit of what I'm trying to do, but then I'll quickly get to what really caused me to create a presentation at six o'clock in the morning. I mentioned the cloud. The cloud is going to make it, is already making it very, very easy for us to start gathering, us in this room, us in the world, to connect and start gathering data. I talked a little bit about those data wells that are being created right now. I think that's actually the most important thing I could do with my life. If you think about all the things you wonder if they're true or not, I mean, we talk a lot about truth, transparency, trust in the media, but also in food. As we start being able to bring devices online that can collect information and put data in a well, all you need to do is put it in a well because there is machine learning layer that is open source, TorchNet, TensorFlow, Facebook, Google, developing tools to eat data. So if you have a project right now, try to do something like what we're trying to do, which is I created a bunch of devices called food computers. We could talk about it later. They create data about plants. That data goes into the cloud and gets stored for later. That's all the point is. And then we can do machine learning, computer vision, artificial intelligence, all the things everybody's stoked about. I've also taken very seriously this idea that we could do huge networked science with the cloud around the world. This is a little community of ragtag innovators that have found my project online, uh, my group's project, Hildreth's here somewhere, I don't know, Hildreth, there she is, assistant director of my group that makes sure that I do things. Uh, these people found my work online for free with no money, very little support. We don't have a lot of time to, to handhold people into what we do, and it's still spread in the last two years to 60 countries and over 2,000 people. These are the ideas. This is how we make huge data sets, how we make change, how we network each other together. I mentioned the project with Laszlo and Basil, so I'm glad I have a follow-up slide. This is a basil in data science. 303 chemicals in basil uh, associated with 974 diseases. Did you know that a basil could stave off you know, <laughs> potential harmful things for you? 703 therapeutic associations. I didn't make this. No human brain could make this. No one in this room could make this. But this is the result of putting many data sets together, doing multivariate analysis, and just seeing what happens. We do that with flavor. What you're looking at here, if you've never seen the visualization of machine learning, is three-dimensional graphing of, in our question, a basil, in our case, a basil. So what does that mean? See how it looks like hot spots? There's like a red spot and a blue spot. Let's say red spot is good. All we were asking our models, the machine learning, was how do we create more oil in a basil? Agriculture would take 10 years to work on this project, it would be in an asynchronistic climate, and it would be incredibly hard to make a definitive correlation. And it would take forever. 
in this case, the machine starts running the scenarios for you in multiple axes over time and creates a hotspot. This red spot with that little green dot or the dots that you see in the vertical version of the graph told us where we should experiment next. Don't go into the other space because the other space isn't gonna get you where you need to go. Go to these places, do an experiment. The machine will then learn and then the machine will be smarter going forward. We won't have to do that again. This is the power of what we're working on now. We've taken some of those models into the real world. On the left, you see climate data that's collected from climate weather stations all over the world for the last 30 years. We took that climate data into our model for, for it's a joint model with a lot of collaborators on cotton. So we took real weather data into a fake model. And that fake model produced a faked world. And that world was a visualization of where the highest quality cotton would be grown. Now it was projecting, we didn't know if it was true. I'm already over time, that's awesome. The yellow spots were where cotton should have been grown with the highest quality. But remember, I said this was old weather data. So we also have old harvest data from the FAO. So we were able to take our fake world, map it against what actually happened with FAO data, and we were about 75% accurate. Again, if it's too early for you to understand what I just said, we were predicting towards the future of what would have happened, and we were 75% right which is you know, pretty good. I mean, I'm not a statistician, obviously, but like, it's good enough for me to know that this is a viable path, that we will use tools like this to construct and simulate the world to see how we will use the world more effectively and efficiently for creating nutrition, all the things that we're looking for. So I'll go really quickly over this because I wasn't supposed to talk about it. So if you're in the audience and you're on this slide and you're wondering what the heck is this guy doing, Barack Obama included, Bunch of us met in Sunnylands a while ago, and you'll see a lot of these same characters here. I see Arthur in the front row. She's going to talk later. You've obviously seen Goodhill, you know, uh, Jason Clay for World Wildlife, Mitchell, uh, everybody, whatever. They're all around. And when we talked, and this random golfer showed up and ruined our, our time, um, <laughs> what we realized was, was that the most interesting thing is none of us understood. We, we see each other at every other conference. We have the same conversations over and over again. We learn something on this stage that n expands our map every time, but we don't capture it. And so the biggest thing to come out of that conversation is we need a map of the future of food. As close to a millennium development goal or sustainable development goal style map as possible. Imagine number one says food waste. And then when you click on number one, it says number 1.1. The, these are the biggest problems in food waste. Number 1.1.1 are some of the addressing solutions, people that are working on amazing things. We could start to run analytics if we had this map. We could start to understand the funding flows, where they're coming from, who's making the most impact, who's way overfunded for the not exciting thing they're doing, and who's way underfunded for doing something amazing. If we're going to keep having these meetings, we need to record what happens in each of them and add it to a public tool that anyone can read, that anyone can use, so that we can start getting strategic rather than raising alarm bells. I'm three minutes over time, so uh, I'll just finish with the most complex diagrams in the world. Um, how would you map the most complex thing in the universe? An ecosystem. Not just an ecosystem, but a self-adaptive ecosystem. Other industries, other projects are already doing things like this, so I wanted to show you that it's possible and to say that I'm literally here with the group that met before with other people behind us that say we're, we want to build this thing tomorrow. So if you want to be involved, just let me know. This is mapping, I'm going to get all of this wrong, I actually wrote something down, which is kind of shocking for me. Okay, the Interactome uh, was built by Laszlo Barabasi's team. What this is doing is mapping the first making the first complex, complex map of a human disease. Uh, to do all of this, plus this, which is a crazy little video, and everybody loves data visualization. What I just showed you was something about asthma. That's the little purple points in there. All this other stuff around what I just showed you is other things that are associated with asthma that we still don't even understand. To build these complex maps took 10 years, took $20 million, and they have now mapped 90% of the human diseases in a way that's 25 times more powerful than traditional bioinformatics. This is going to change the world. It only took $20 million. There are people in this room with pockets full of $20 million. 
we could map the food system, at least begin brick by brick with the genius that's sitting in the audience. I'm not alone in thinking this is the way to change the world. You have Elon open source the patents of Tesla. Why? Not because he doesn't love money, but because he'd really like there to be road infrastructure and charging stations for his cars so people would buy them. And he can't build all the roads and all the charging infrastructure, so he has to tell people how it works. This is the networked world, the networked economy. The most closed source company of all time, Apple, open sources their app developer language. Why? Because they need to compete with everybody else that's open sourcing things to get the most amount of users, to create the most amount of data, to be able to do something intelligent with it. Of course, we've seen, I've talked about Facebook's AI being open, and, and the best example that I have is the Human Genome Project. Tens of thousands of researchers, tens of millions of dollars, and now the, the human genome, it went what? It, I know the numbers off the top of my head, it's something like six years ago was like a million dollars, and today it's like a thousand dollars to do a human genome. This is stuff that we can do for the future of food. So I'll end with that. I'm only five minutes over time, which I think is a record uh, for me at EAT. Um, I'll end with this. Of everything I've told you, of the world I've just shown you, of the world you're about to see on this stage from entrepreneurs, from inventors, from technologists, when we want to put this map together, the question I have is, are you in? Thank you. <laughs>